Welcome, everyone. On behalf of Staff Assembly, I'd like to welcome you to this Well-Being During Work Transitions Town Hall. It's co-hosted by Staff Assembly and the Simmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center. My name is Joy Kruger. I am the president of Staff Assembly this year. Welcome, welcome. All right, I am joined today by my co-host, Wendy Slesser, who is the Associate Vice Provost of the Simmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center at UCLA. She's also the Clinical Professor of Pediatrics in the Schools of Medicine and Public Health. And she was the chair of the Wellness and Work Expectations Working Group of the COVID-19 Crisis and Response and Recovery Task Force. Uh, thank you so much, Joy. I'd like to also welcome everyone on behalf of myself and the co-chairs of the task force, Administrative Vice Chancellor Michael Beck and Professor, uh, my, Vice Chancellor Michael Beck and Professor Megan McAvoy. Welcome as well as immediate past chair of the Faculty Senate, Professor Shane White. And as you can see, they're all here today during this town hall. Since June, the Wellness and Work Expectations Working Group has discussed the importance of a town hall focused on well being for our staff and faculty. So I'm grateful to have this opportunity to speak to all of you today. We are also so grateful that all of you took the time to attend this town hall. And we will be recording this town hall for all those who could not make it today. Please note additional town halls and webinars in the coming weeks will address the more operational and public health mitigation and compliance aspects of our work transitions. We recognize many questions submitted for today's event are more relevant for these future sessions and rest assured we have passed them along to those organizing the upcoming town halls and webinars. We'll begin today with five expert panelists presenting topics focused on the well being of staff and faculty during work transitions. For a deeper dive into the topics, I recommend listening to the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Live Well podcast and other links listed on this town hall's Bruin post. The podcast include in depth interviews with each speaker on the themes presented today. After the presentations, we will move into the Q&A portion of the session. Please feel free to use the Q&A function in this Zoom webinar to submit questions. So first among our panelists is Dr. Peter Katona, who many of you know from previous town halls. Dr. Katona is a clinical professor of medicine and the, at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and adjunct professor at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He's the chair of the Infectious Control Work Group in the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Task Force. Please let us welcome Dr. Peter Katona. Thank you, Wendy. I'm gonna start by giving a 20,000 foot view of what's going on around us so that we can put what's going on locally into better perspective. Nationally, we are today where we were in February. Locally, though, we're in much better shape than that. Delta variant is a problem, but vaccine hesitancy is a bigger problem. Uh, new cases are leveling off in certain places, but not elsewhere. Hospitalized cases are flat, occurring mostly in the unvaccinated. And vaccinations aren't really picking up the way we expected them to. Deaths haven't come down yet, but there is a lag between cases and, death, and deaths. But interestingly, it's been estimated now that one in, you have a one in 5,000 chance per day of getting infected if you're vaccinated. And if you live in a highly vaccinated area or you take precautions, it may even be up to one in 10,000 per day. So the chances are looking better and better, better now as things progress. Now, what about children? Uh, cases in children on the rise, they're highest in the, in the least vaccinated states. 
And now it's estimated that one in four new cases occur in children five to 17 years old, which includes some of our college population for various immunological reasons. Now, what about reopening college campuses? It's happening to almost every university in the United States. There's been a polarizing debate around the Delta variant, vaccines and masks, which have complicated campus discussions about virus safety. The American College of Health Association recommended vaccination requirements for all on-campus higher education students, as we have done. And CDC has recommended face coverings regardless of vaccine status for indoor public spaces, especially when infection rates are high. But at some campuses, vaccination is optional and mask wearing while recommended can't be enforced. So university administrators everywhere are desperately trying to avoid the pitfalls of last year when outbreaks at some campuses spread the virus into more surrounding communities. Faculty are sometimes calling for stricter enforced safety precautions, weighed against the fear of losing students and revenue. And with those fed up with the online education process. So we're prepared to change course if necessary. We've developed thresholds for pivots from both medical, statistical, and practical perspectives. We've gotten wastewater testing, surveillance testing, and we have many levels and jurisdictions. We're not an island in a sea of COVID. We're a very specific area. And we don't really take the global perspective into account because it's way too complicated. Hospitals are inversely related to vaccinations. About 95% of hospitalizations are seem to be in the unvaccinated. And infection rates in the least vaccinated states are four times as high as the most vaccinated states. Masks work. They're proven to reduce community spread. We have certain gradations of ones that work better than others. And basically the filtering efficiency is quite high. They interestingly also seem to have disproportionately help the older population. So what about boosters? Should we take boosters? Are they an issue? And the answer is eventually probably yes. Um, there's been a poor messaging quagmire between CDC and the White House and the FDA and Pfizer to get the right messaging out about something that should never have been called a booster in the first place, but rather a third in a series. You know, it's not been approved from Moderna, it has the same formulation. And I think we have to pay attention to what's happening, not on the 20th of September, but the 16th of September, where the ACIP CDC's committee is going to decide about recommendations. So basically I'll finish with what to watch for. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Does Delta cause more severe disease than earlier versions? or equally severe symptoms in the average infected person while clearly being more contagious. How much do the vaccinated infected spread the virus? Where are we with local herd immunity? What's the effectiveness of masks and vaccine mandates? Will pivot parameters actually need to be activated? Will there be a new worse or better variant that might come along? Are we gonna have a bad flu year? Back to school is potentially problematic as a super spreader event, and we're hoping that doesn't happen. Understand that there is a difference between the K through 12 immunity levels and the IHE communities and what their immunity levels are. LAUSD is going to basically mandate vaccinations. It's going to go to their board meeting coming up. So where are we headed with political discord dissemination of misinformation and conspiracy theories. But I'll leave you on a high note, and that is that legal precedent historically has been on the side of public health and common sense. And I'll finish with that. Thank you, Dr. Katona. And now our next speaker is Dr. Nava Yagane. Returning to campus on Returning to work on campus also may mean a concern for parents who have children in pre-K through 12th grade, returning to in-person instruction. 
Dr. Navan Yagane is a medical epidemiologist at LA County Department of Public Health and assistant professor for maternal child health preventive medicine at UCLA, and will address some of these concerns. Thank you so much. I just have a few slides. Um, I am going to highlight some of the same points that uh, Dr. Katona highlighted with some of the data that we've collected over um, in LA County. So first, just to highlight the epidemiology of COVID-19 in children, based on what we know so far, we know that kids can get infected with SARS-CoV-2 and that the risk of transmission, especially in households, seem to be equal to that of adults. Um, there have been a lot of household uh, transmission studies. It's the transmission in more public regulated settings has been less well studied, um, but based on the studies we have, it seems like it, is, um, it can be mitigated with appropriate prevention me methods. As far as medical care and risk for symptomatic disease or severe illness, so far, the research really shows that children and adolescents are less likely to seek testing and medical care probably because they're less at risk for symptomatic or severe disease. Um, that's not saying that they can't get severe disease or they can't have symptoms. Um, however, compared to adults, they seem to have a lower risk of this. There were two different publications that came out um, just earlier this week, and I think uh, Dr. Katona maybe mentioned one of them. One is showing the effect of Delta variant on pediatric hospitalizations. And specifically, this study showed that hospitalizations in those aged um, zero to four has increased tenfold because of Delta. Um, and that when you look at vaccinated versus unvaccinated, those who are unvaccinated have a 10 time higher risk of high hospitalizations as compared to those um, who are fully vaccinated. The other point that was made um, was that the Delta variant, although it is more contagious, it doesn't seem to increase your risk for hospitalization. So you have higher absolute numbers. The percentage seems to be roughly equal. Um, and that's similar to the data we're seeing in Los Angeles County. Again, very contagious. Um, and so we have to do everything possible to mitigate this infection, um, but it doesn't necessarily seem to result in higher levels of hospitalization. When we looked at vaccination rates and when they compared states that had low levels of vaccination versus those who had high levels of vaccination, um, they saw that the hospitalizations increased fourfold in those states with low levels of vaccination. Again, this isn't just a vaccination for children, it's vaccination for all age groups. So if you are able to increase your vaccination rate in the community, you're able to affect the risk of hospitalization in children and adolescents. This is also another MMWR article that was published um, just recently. This was um, data collected last year in Los Angeles County by our colleagues. And they looked at um, case rates and the population for ch all children versus children who attended public TK through 12 schools. So that all children is uh, indicated by the dark blue bars and then the light blue bars are those who attended TK through 12 um, schools. And you can see that the rate um, was much actually lower in children who actually went to school last year. And this is again, because in schools, there's a lot of mitigation strategies in play. Um, we have a lot of guidance on how to keep schools as safe as possible. They actually looked at this in adults as well. So the black bars are the adults and all adults, um, 18 to 79 years of age in LA County. And then the gray bars are the staff members who worked in TK through 12 schools. And again, you can see that the case rates were actually higher in adults as well um, going into March. And that's when we started vaccinating um, staff and adults. Now I'm gonna just share some data that we shared during the press conferences. This is our data in Los Angeles County as of August 31st. You can see that we vaccinated about 5.2 million people. Of those, 0.71% have tested positive, 0.02% have been hospitalized and 0.002% have died. This again, just shows you how incredibly powerful our vaccines are at preventing hospitalization and death. 
I also wanted to show the, the hospitalization rates in a different way. Um, this looks at, um, the, so the dot, dotted line is unvaccinated individuals, whereas the solid lines are the fully vaccinated individuals. And you can again see that our hospitalizations for COVID-19 are driven by unvaccinated individuals who are 50 years of age and older, and those who are 18 to 49 years of age. You don't see the hospitalization rates in those who are fully vaccinated that are comparable. Of course, all of us are very interested in our children's health as well. This is looking at case rates, not hospitalization, case rates. So this is case rates per, um, per vaccination status and age. And currently in pediatrics, the individuals who have the highest uh, case rates are unvaccinated 12 to 17 year olds, followed by the five to 11 year olds, followed by the unvaccinated zero to four year olds. And then at the very bottom is the vaccinated 12 to 17 year olds. I again want to highlight that those who are vaccine eligible have the highest um, case rates. And so if we could really improve our case, our vaccination rates in the 12 to 17 year olds, we could very um, significantly decrease the amount of hospitalizations we're seeing in the pediatric groups. This also looks at the hospitalization rates and death rates in pediatrics. And again, you can see for 100,000, for the 12 to 17 year olds, the case incidence rate is 57 for the vaccinated, 480 for the unvaccinated. When you look at the hospitalizations, again, you see that the hospitalization rates for those who are 12 to 17 and unvaccinated, it's 2.5 versus 0.3 for those who are vaccinated. Um, we do, unfortunately, are, we are seeing hospitalizations in five to 11 years of age and four, zero to four years of age, but those are much less than what we're seeing in um, the adolescent group. And luckily we have not experienced many deaths um, due to COVID-19 in Los Angeles County. Um, I did mention that we do have a lot of best practices and um, ways to keep schools safe. This is based on all the data that's been collected in the United States and internationally. Um, we are recommending, recommending and very supportive of vaccinating all adolescents based on the data we have and that I've shared with you. Um, we're very supportive of the vaccine mandates that are occurring at different school districts, both independent and public school districts. And like Dr. Katono mentioned, we are waiting to hear for, from LAUSD about their decision on this topic. Masking is effective. We are in, um, requiring masks indoors um, and we're asking everyone to continue to mask in crowded outdoor spaces. We are also working on ways to maximize airflow in the school building. So if you can be um, outdoors, please be outdoors. If you can't be outdoors and you're indoors, do everything possible to ventilate that space. Um, and you know we have all sorts of recommendations on that front. We also are very excited that we have some of the highest testing, pro highest numbers of tests being done in, um, in uh, the K through 12 schools here in Los Angeles County. So many of our school districts are participating in a weekly testing program. Um, they're also using this um, testing program to identify individuals who are infected and then being able to quarantine those who um, might have been exposed and um, having them do more frequent testing. And then finally, um, we encourage everyone to do a lot of messaging and information sharing. And um, we hope that we can hopefully get this news out and continue to have a really successful return to school. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yagane. Uh, next, we have Dr. Brenda Birch who is a professor and clinical psychologist in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences and Pediatrics. She has served on the leadership team for the UCLA Health David Geffen School of Medicine COVID-19 Wellness and Mental Health Work Group, which developed an array of resources and services to provide emotional support to UCLA health trainees, staff, and faculty who have been impacted by COVID-19. Thank you, Wendy, for having me here today. Um, I, you know, in this brief amount of time, I'm just going to share a brief um, framework that people might consider adopting as they are thinking about um, return back into um, the work or school setting. Um, and as Wendy mentioned, there's, if you're interested in any of these topics, um, we have a series of podcasts that, um, 
we'll bring you on a deeper dive. Um, so the big picture is the idea that if we can really honor and process all of the emotions related to the challenges we faced um, over the last year and a half, and really be thoughtful as we think about what um, we want to keep or add or change in our life, really focus on the topics of enhancing joy and meaning, we will be able to really optimize our resilience. Um, much of what I'm going to say is really geared towards the individual with recognition that, you know, obviously the UCLA health system, our larger governments and our family, there's all sorts of levels of um, interventions to think about, but this is really focused on the individual. Um, the first part of this is really honoring and, you know, and processing the sorrows and the loss over the last year, which could be the loss of loved ones. Um, it could be the loss of activities that you're really looking forward to, the loss of just having your normal life. Um, you know, listed up here are some of the emotions that some of you might have or, or thoughts that you might be having um, now or over the past year and that might continue. And, you know, I put them there um, just to emphasize you're not alone if you're experiencing a lack of motivation, if you're grumpy, if you're angry, um, any of those emotions are very common right now. And, um, you know, some could be based on fear, some could be based on, you know, that let's, that's legitimate, and some could be, you know, based on um, not feeling very ambivalent about coming back. Um, and some of it can be um, due to loss. Um, so if you've had grief or trauma, you know, very briefly, it's helpful to label that and to try to find a way to tell your story, either verbally or in written form, and to also try to balance some of that work with trying to cultivate moments of joy or looking for things that you can be great, um, have gratitude for so that your brain can take some breaks. I'm not going to go through all of these right now because we don't have time, but um, we do go through these more in depth um, in the podcast. Podcast. Um, the next one is to really kind of assess where you're at. Um, and I'm, you know, I've been using the PERMA model recently based on positive psychology with the idea of really focusing your attention on things that could really cultivate increased joy or meaning. And so the first one is, you know, identifying what gives you good feelings, what gives you those little boosts of, you know, laughter or joy or um, loving feelings, what makes you feel like you're living meaningfully, that you're doing something that's bigger than yourself, that's contributing. You know, where are you at with regard to your relationships at work and at home? Can you cultivate relationships that you find really supportive and replenishing and figure out a way to mitigate your exposure to people who maybe are a little bit more challenging for you and drain you of your energy? What kind of inspirational goals do you have? Those are really helpful, not only to get you through those rough days to remember why you're doing it, but also to remind you to celebrate the little milestones along the way towards reaching your goals. And what really consumes your attention and passion? And are you spending, you know, a, a, a certain amount of your week doing something that really does consume you? If you can spend at least 20% of your time engaged in something that's really meaningful, then that can help protect you against burnout. Once you kind of figure out, you know, where you are in relationship to those things, you can start to build your own toolbox to help support your well-being and your opportunity to flourish as you come back. Um, and that could include things like making sure that you have healthy routines in place. I know somebody in the chat mentioned the importance of some of the prevention um, wellness activities, like watching your diet and your weight and, you know, vitamins and all of those types of things, making sure you have personal policies that you feel comfortable with and that you practice how you're going to reinforce those to others who might not feel the same way. What kind of coping skills do you have? Do you need to learn more or practice them? You know, I have some listed here, um, but there's other as well. And if you want to hear more, again, we cover some of this in our podcasts. Um, you know, getting very concrete, it might be that you need to transition to your optimal sleep set 
um, schedule and, you know, preparation for coming back. You might have to figure out um, what kind of changes in your schedules are needed. You might need to um, make a sign to put in your workspace telling people you want them to stay six feet away. You know, those are a few ideas. Um, you know, other ones can include, you know, just remembering that when you have those waves of anxiety to take some deep breaths and to try to put yourself into a relaxed state and to let those waves of anxiety go through you. Um, you know, things are going to be different and it's important that we have support for that, that we reach out to each other. And it's important to really let somebody know if you're struggling, you know, we're in this together and we really need to rely upon each other especially through this uncertainty that we have coming up in front of us. So that was very quick. Um, as I mentioned, we have three podcasts that dive deeper into each of these three sec um, sections that you can um, locate at the Live Well podcast through Healthy Campus Initiative. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Birch. The more joy, the better, I always say. All right, our next panelist is Dr. Alan Avidan, who is the professor of neurology in the David Geffen School of Medicine and director, excuse me, my screen went wonky. Okay, um, the director of the Sleep Disorder Center. Dr. Avidan will share how to improve sleep quality and address something called COVID somnia. Thank you so much, Joy. I'm going to share my uh, presentation. Give me two seconds. Um, and it's a pleasure to be on board. And thanks so much for inviting me and for having a lecture on a, on a sleep. This is, this is really great. I think I got the wrong presentation, though. Sorry. I'm going to go back and um, give me two seconds. And I think we should have it ready to go in one second. Well, you know what I'm going to do here. Uh, keynote is, is a bit of a problem. So let me do this. Let me um, do this. Let me find a presentation here and share with you this portion. And can you can everyone see my screen and the initial slide? Wonderful. So a pleasure to be on board. My name is Alon Avidan. <clears throat> Most patients call me Dr. Adivan, <clears throat> which is uh, very appropriate for a sleep physician. But I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the issues related to sleep disorders in the setting of a pandemic and also uh, some uh, opportunities for everyone to reflect and really think about your own sleep patterns and, and recognize what amazing opportunities we have to improve sleep. The first is to uh, unravel some prevailing myths. And the first one is that you can, you can get by with six or seven hours of sleep and you can train your brain to get less. And that's, that's incorrect. You need about seven to eight hours, whether you're 18 or 80 years old. Any, everyone over age 18 requires seven to eight hours and regular sleep. Duration and regularity are really critical. Um, the next myth is that you can uh, make up for lost uh, sleep on the weekend. It doesn't end up being this way. Unfortunately, sleep is not like a bank account. You can't make it up by sleeping a little bit longer the next day. For one hour of sleep deprivation, you need really a full day of appropriate sleep duration to recover. The next myth is that you can tell when you're getting too tired to work, drive, and study. And unfortunately, the subjective ability of a person to know when they're too tired is very poor. Now, I want to mention that in our brain, our brain really is making up a lot, a lot of uh, um, cellular metabolites uh, during the day. Those proteins and abnormal toxins and cellular metabolites have to go somewhere at the end of the day. And it ends up that the glymphatic system of the brain takes away the garbage, takes away all, everything that is a, um, not necessary, that lingers on in the cerebral spinal fluid, and it gets rid of it. The glymphatic system only functions during the night, during sleep, and it needs appropriate seven to eight hours of sleep to really work 
appropriately. If it doesn't, if you don't get enough sleep, those proteins build up and they make up abnormal proteins like beta amyloid that is really the substrate of Alzheimer's dementia. And this is really critical to understand that sleep is not a passive process. You need it in order to feel refreshed and also prevent other conditions that can, they can become problematic later in life. One of the critical factors, and there was a chat a question about <clears throat> how do we get back to normal routines when everyone's been kind of a, has this irregularities in their sleep-wake patterns. And the one appropriate and the most critical factor is light, light exposure, avoidance too much, avoidance of inappropriate blue light, particularly after 9 p.m., and maximizing, increasing bright light exposure, going outside, getting bright light between 7 to 8 in the morning. Uh, a lot of uh, students that I've seen and staff likewise uh, have had a circadian disturbance uh, during the pandemic. Uh, they've maintained uh, sleep-wake schedule that would be more appropriate for Honolulu or even Tokyo. Going to bed at 3 or 4 in the morning and waking up at 11, 12, afternoon, and, and really to make that transition, you really need to use appropriate light. Light can be your savior here. Um, here are some countermeasures to improve sleep. The first is to recognize some of the um, um, uh, clinical signs of a poor and uh, inappropriate and insufficient sleep, paucity of movement, keeping your difficulties, keeping your eyes open in lectures, and of course, poor concentration. But really, um, the countermeasures to, uh, that are really critical to try and uh, focus on is the avoidance of inappropriate light uh, before bedtime. For a lot of our patients, say, uh, this inappropriate bright light, particularly before they go to bed, watching the news in bed, texting in bed, bringing the laptop in bed, never ever a good idea because the blue light from the television screen is very activating and it delays the secretion of melatonin. You need melatonin to shut down your circadian clock so you can fall asleep. Without it, you, you are going to miss an opportunity to have regularities in your sleep-wake patterns. Avoiding substances, of course, caffeine and alcohol, too much exercise. Exercise is good, it's great um, in the late afternoon, but after four or five o'clock, it can be uh, fairly activating. Being able to recognize and appreciate signs of insomnia and being able to really ask the primary physician for a referral when you're in trouble, when, when you run into difficulties. The last thing you want to do is use alcohol. Alcohol is very enticing, but there's a problem. You know what the problem is? When you go to sleep, you stop drinking. And then it ends up waking you up when the blood alcohol levels begin to drop. And that's, that's what you pay for. This is actually from one of my patients who used scotch at 11 o'clock, had some scotch, woke up, fell asleep at 11.30, woke up at 4 a.m. and I had another scotch. I think he crossed it out, but I think he actually had it. Fell asleep at 4.15, woke up at 5.24, had another scotch. And this talks about the fact that alcohol is never really a good drug to, for insomnia because of rebound and the fact that it doesn't really sustain itself. Plan napping, there was a really good question in the Q&A, um, uh, in the uh, chat about naps. Naps are really great. Power naps, 15 or 20 minutes between, um, between 12 to 3 p.m. So right around now is appropriate. It's, it's okay, 15 or 20 minutes is all you need. And 15 or 20 minutes is equivalent to about 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is really a, a, a 20 ounce a cup of Starbucks. Here are some good foods to have if you're having a hard time falling asleep. Tart cherry juice, interestingly, is a, has some good qualities, but also food items that have tryptophan. Uh, really remember some of the re, uh, key issues about maintaining and optimizing appropriate sleep environment, keeping the bedroom temperature about 60, 65 degrees actually makes it comfortable and helps people fall asleep, making a list of things you need to do the next day rather than bringing the, those thoughts and intrusive uh, thoughts say, in bed and ruminating. That can, that can be a problem for a lot of folks with uh, insomnia. 
Caffeine can be temporarily effective, uh, but knowing when to drink it, of course, uh, not afternoon, um, because that can interfere with your ability to fall asleep. Napping, just one last thing about naps. You see this dip here, just around 12 to 3 o'clock. That's when your wake propensity as a, is at its lowest. Our colleagues over in the South America and in, in Europe, they take a siesta. Here in the U.S., we go to Starbucks, but really I want you to think about this opportunity for a refreshing 15 or 20 minute power nap that can be extremely, extremely useful. And in fact, it can increase cognitive function by about 40%. Uh, driving when sleepy, never a good idea. Try to, if you find that you're drowsing off, you need to see a sleep physician. But, you know, blowing cold air doesn't work unless you live in Michigan. I can tell you for a fact because I've had the situation. But slapping yourself, promising yourself a reward when you get home doesn't work. You need to take a break or um, have someone else uh, do the driving. Lastly, sleep is fundamental for better concentration, memory, um, for improving your ability to make decisions, for academic excellence, really, and poor sleep, unfortunately, can be problematic. So here are some, I'm going to leave you with some uh, final thoughts on the uh, critical factors as we are heading towards uh, reopening and the uh, avoidance of a uh, prolonged time in bed, using the bed only for sleep. You can also add sleep, sex, and sickness, the three S's that would be appropriate, uh, maintaining a regular sleep-wake pattern, and uh, waking up and going to bed at the same time, optimizing seven to eight hours of sleep. And with that, I'm going to end. And thanks, everyone, for your attention. And uh, happy to take some questions at the end. Thanks so much. Hello, y'all. Uh, thank you so much for that. I have some sleeping to do uh, tonight more than normal and making that my new normal. So thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Abedin. Our final panelist is Dr. Nicole Green, who currently serves as Executive Director of Student Mental Health Services. She oversees programs and services that provide mental health and well-being prevention, education, clinical care, and crisis support for students. Dr. Green will address emotional health and diversity topics related to work. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for hanging in there with us to try to provide some support around your well-being as we transition back to campus. I'm going to share my screen as well and just provide a few um, reminders and thoughts um, that some of which have already been shared, but just to reiterate. Um, I'm going to say, let me first put this in slideshow mode. Um, COVID and mental health with regard to um, just the diversity of who we are. Um, COVID has had a negative impact on our mental health. I think we all know that. Four, during the pandemic, four in 10 adults in the US reported symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, but that's up from one in 10 adults in some studies. Um, in addition, as was shared, just shared, difficulty with sleeping, eating, difficulty with increased alcohol and substance use, difficulty with worrying and worsening chronic conditions and stress. Um, obviously, I think there have been a number of comments in the Q&A and chat around both isolation, but also just, con just the chronic nature of the change over the last two years. What we know is that women with children have reported more symptoms of anxiety and depression than men. And we know that uh, the childcare issues, putting our kids back in school, all while trying to navigate, trying to get back to campus ourselves has been really challenging. The pandemic has disproportionately affected the health of communities of color. We know, um, many of you have heard this, um, <clears throat> but Black and Latino um, adults really suffering um, in many different ways. And we already know this is on top of a lot of health disparities. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm just here to reiterate, we're holding a lot of different kinds of stress. I think there's this acute, short-lived peak of stress that we're in right now related to all of the transition, putting children back in school, transitioning back to campus, the COVID vaccine, the variants, the chronic change in the nature of all of this is really exhausting and stressful. The chronic long-term unrelenting stress um, among all folks, but particularly in communities of color, is typically a big problem as well. 
you know, we also are struggling with the use stress. A lot of things have changed for the positive over the course of the last few months in particular. Weddings are happening. Um, things are more in person. People are traveling again. But those are also stressful life events. And there's also been the distress of all of the competing ideas, the politics, the difficulty with everyone getting on the same page around the virus. You know, what we know is that, you know, there's a certain amount of stress that's optimal and keeps us going, keeps us from being bored and just kind of vegging on the sofa. But many of us right now are in strong anxiety or even in a meltdown state of things being so erratic with regard to our schedules, our routines, questions about our own safety and our own wanting to protect ourselves and our loved ones. The burnout, and I saw this a lot in the Q&A for staff, um, and supervisors and folks trying to run the institution, the emotional exhaustion of overextending, being asked to do more in this time, the feeling of difficulty getting motivated, having faith, um, assuming the best intent is really challenging when you're in crisis and survival mode. The depersonalization, the feeling of like, I can't take on someone else's need when I'm struggling to like tread water in my own. The feeling of like, I need to distance myself from other, from work, from other things to prevent my own going underwater. The feelings of ineffectiveness, the lack of like that I have control in my life is also a sign of the burnout and the fatigue that I think is real right now. Then we add on this, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how this disproportionately has impacted communities of color. There are layers of this that are on top of layers of this that, you know, this doesn't exist without context and access to health care and trust in the medical system and difficulty understanding why some folks are like engaged in the medical science around this and folks that are hesitant and resistant or concerned or have questions. Um, and all of this is related to some of the longstanding interpersonal, institutional, and systemic racial in, um, inequalities that have just been maintained. The inter internalized racial beliefs uh, that we have in general, and then the interpersonal microaggressions that happen in the workspace. I've seen a lot of recent work on, you know, a lot of people of color wanting to stay home because I don't want to deal with the microaggressions again. I don't want to come back to campus. Um, and then the institutional policies and practices that make it hard for um, folks to feel like they're part of the institution. And across various institutions, we've looked at education and politics and the ways in which um, our country has been divided in these ways. And then the systemic racial inequalities that have made this disproportionately troubling for many communities. So what happens with all that? I feel like we've been in a period of um, trauma for over 18 months where you have a traumatic re reaction. And it's really, in re you know, we go either two ways. We go really hyper vigilant and anxious and irritable, or we go kind of like shut down and isolated and retreat. And I kind of like to just break it down. Like some of us are turtles in this. Some of us become rabbits and want to run. Some of us are tigers and just, you know, want to protect and kind of in some ways lash out wherever we can. It's like hard to even tolerate someone got our name wrong on the Starbucks or um, order because we're also dealing with my kid's schedule. I just got an info, a note that my class has to quarantine. I don't have time for any more. I don't have any more bandwidth. So in these times where we're aware of all this and yet the world is pushing us back into um, our, old, our old lives, it can feel like you know, we're doing this on our own. You know, where's my support? What about me? And feel very um, kind of really in our most basic fight, flight or freeze response. Um, and in those, you know, what, what I wanna just reiterate in this is, um, really honoring that we're kind of really at that place and the, and the trauma reaction feels really real. And um, we are, you know, in our most basic state, some of us want to hide, some of us want to blend in, some of us want to fight, some of us, you know, kind of just play dead and just like, okay, whatever you tell me to do, because we don't really have a lot left. In those, I'm going to go back to what was said earlier. Managing, you know, I talk about being brew and brave, managing your basic needs to regulate your body, to bring down all the hormonal systems that are about fight, fight, or freeze so that you can begin to regulate somewhere. I think um, Dr. Adivan's uh, um, information is really critical here. 
radical self-care of acknowledging all the things that were say, said by Brenda Birch, giving yourself permission to feel a lot of things, even joy, which is hard. Um, the asserting yourself, finding ways to have safe and brave spaces, the investing in your mental health um, through self-compassion and affirmation. And then the E is engaging in love, belonging, and community, finding safe spaces to be engaged. This is gonna be critical to resilience. Resilience is about managing basic needs, finding your social support, and finding the joy and the mastery in this chaos. Because when life is chaotic, we really wanna to try to hold on to those anchors. The last thing I'll say in this is that as we're transitioning, acknowledging change takes time. Um, as we're in this new transition, really thinking about, instead of saying, can I do this? I can do this. Will I do this? I will do this. Am I gonna be able to? I am going to be able to. So using those affirmations so that you can make change and feel efficacious in it. And I know there's a lot that's out of our control right now, but really trying to anchor around, if nothing else, just trying to live in the moment and taking a breath, trying to be non-judgmental about what you're feeling, getting it out how you can, being on purpose, being intentional with yourself and what your needs are and asserting those in the places that you need to. So those are the best ways to think about, you know, especially around all of our identity and all the complexity that comes with it and all the distrust and mistrust that's here, trying to stay close to what's here and right now and what can I control. Um, and I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green and all of our panelists. That was fantastic to hear from all of you. All right, we're going to go into a Q&A portion for the rest of our time together. Um, we did collect some questions ahead of time, so we're going to start by answering some of those popular questions first. Uh, as always, feel free to pop a question of yours in the chat. We're answering as many as possible live um, on chat on not chat, on the Q&A function as well. Um, but let me start by asking Peter a question. Um, let's see, how can we combat misinformation about the vaccine within our departments or groups of work effectively? Well, that's a challenge. Um, there's a lot of misinformation brewing from medications that cause more harm than good to other things. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, to effectively challenge that at all levels. Um, obviously, talking to people, getting the right message out in the right way is important, and that's not been done particularly well by the government in many ways. So getting that right message out, the more you introduce a message and keep saying it, the better people will understand it and react to it. Um, I think it's helped to make the vaccine, especially the Pfizer vaccine, fully approved. I think that makes a difference in terms of getting people to kind of come on board. Um, but we have to kind of be constantly messaging and re-messaging the mis-messaging that's been going on all the time here. Um, and I think that's the most important thing we need to do. Thank you, Peter. Oh, and I forgot to mention, y'all, um, as a reminder, we're going to be focusing on well-being related questions during our time here together. If you have questions about operational public health mitigation compliance questions, those will be answered at a later date. So feel free to have those questions, hold them. We've got another town hall coming up soon, I believe on the 14th. Uh, so stay tuned and let's get those questions answered for you then. All right, I'm turning it over to, let's see, Nava, I have a question for you. I'm returning to work on campus and concerned about protecting my children who are not old enough to get the COVID vaccine. Can you offer some suggestions on how to keep my children safe? Yeah, so that's a great question. I also am in that same uh, mind frame as I have two school age children who are in school and are, are um, not vaccine eligible yet. And so I'm very eagerly waiting for the vaccine. Um, as, as someone who works with COVID units and COVID patients, um, I think the most important things I do is, you know, follow the science. I know the ways to keep myself safe or to get myself vaccinated to wear a mask, to wear the appropriate personal protective um, equipment, um, and then to try to stay in well-ventilated spaces. Um, so I, I do, you know, I, I try to 
be in the now and follow the science and really um, focus on the layers of mitigation that we have shown work. And we know how this virus works. We're not in March 2020 um, or February 2020. We, we, we know how this um, virus is transmitted and we know how to prevent it. So um, that's really what I focus on. Um, and I would think that that would be an effective strategy, hopefully for everyone else as well. All right, and let's go to Brenda. All right, what if faculty slash staff coworkers exhibit concerning behaviors in the aftermath of COVID-19? What do you advise? Thanks for that question. Um, what I would say is that you want to check in with people. If you notice that they're not behaving in a way that you are used to seeing them behave, um, say something to them. Say, you know, normally you're on time for meetings and I noticed that you've been late. Uh, I just want to check in. Is everything okay? Do you want to chat? Um, I noticed that you usually are really jokey or talkative and you don't seem that way. Um, and I, so I just want to find out, you know, if, if there's anything you need from me. Um, and then listen um, and be curious and compassionate about what you hear. Ask what would be helpful at that time. Do you need somebody to vent with or can I share some resources with you that might be useful to you? But the idea is to really try to understand um, from a place of compassion what that person is going through and to express your confidence in their ability and offer you know, your assistance, um, giving them the choice about what they know would be best for them. All right, thank you for that. Okay, let's go to Alon. What are some tips for adjusting sleep schedules as some of us return to campus? Great question. So um, uh, the first and foremost, and, and what I'm gonna do is quickly go back to my uh, slide presentation. Um, and here, here they are. I think that, can you all see the presentation? Thumbs up if you can. Great. So if you can all remember that one of the key factors that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation is maintaining regularity in your sleep-wake pattern. So think of it as adjusting to daylight saving time. If you have been maintaining a schedule of going to bed late and waking up late, sort of working in the, on the Honolulu time zone, uh, kind of the social jet lag, if you will, the, the most critical thing to do is to start implementing changes now. Going to bed earlier, by half an hour, 15 minutes earlier. Waking up by half an hour, 15 minutes earlier. Maximizing, increasing light exposure. Many people are socially isolated. They're intellectually isolated. They're not getting light exposure. Their vitamin D levels are dropping. Vitamin D is really important for proper sleep and circadian function, as well as a proper immune function. So the, the fact is you need appropriate light exposure, not through glasses, not through a window, but actually being outside for at least uh, half an hour to 45 minutes, seven to eight o'clock. That signal, the circadian signal from light expo exposure from the sun is the most significant and the most powerful um, circadian cue and the one factor that can help readjust and give that circadian clock a signal to start waking you up earlier and making you start making you feel sleepy at the appropriate period of time. And the key factor is if you are still watching TV and watching um, uh, the, uh, the, the news, the shows after 9 p.m. to start knowing that if you do that, you're gonna delay the release of melatonin and that can actually make it difficult for you to make the adjustment. One key factor that's really easy to do, keep the temperature at around 60 to 65 degrees. You don't need to use the AC all the way up. You can even use a cooling pillow, a Technogel cooling pillow. And I'm going to provide the, um, all these resources as a PDF later on. So don't, don't worry if you didn't get the name. The Technogel pillow allows for, for uh, cooling down effect um, and helps the brain to cool down and that can be very effective in case you have a difficult time shutting your brain off. 
there are some resources for mindfulness. There were some, many questions about people who can't really leave the, the bedroom area or the, the bed because their apartments are too small. You can still do mindfulness meditation. You can still do deep breathing and relaxation techniques. And UCLA has a mindfulness center that can help facilitate that. But it's really important to make sure you preserve the circadian timing and the sleep bed irregularity. And if you're finding that you're a little bit off now, starting to make those changes early so you don't have to kind of catch up when, when you start going to and, and uh, uh, starting to arrive to work and you're a little bit sleep deprived. Thank you, Alan. That was fantastic. Really appreciate that. And now, last but not least, we'll be um, asking a question to Nicole, Dr. Nicole Green for uh, an answer, and then we'll make some concluding remarks. So, um, Nicole, there's so many questions that people ask, but we'll ask one simple one. How can you manage, or maybe not so simple, how can you manage anxiety during this time? Yeah, not so simple. Um, I think, you know, first of all, recognizing the part that you can control, you know, anxiety is about our worries about the future. Um, and well, one of the things to just be mindful of is, you know, can you take breaks from social media? Can you only look at the news once a day if that's what's stressing you out? With understanding, there's two ways to go with the routine disruption that we're dealing with, either kind of not holding yourself so rigid to the routine that it feels claustrophobic, or you feel like you're failing every day. Also accepting that we're in a time of transition and that your routine may not be stable for a little while here. The anxiety around what's going on in the world, doing the best you can to stay as informed as you can, stay knowledgeable, be really vigilant about the mitigation strategies around COVID. So a lot of it is, again, taking care of your, your physical self, managing your social relationships and getting support when you need to, and then reaching out for support and acknowledging that, you know, your anxiety is really disrupting what's going on in your life and really, really being honest about that and reaching out for support. Oh, thank you so much, Nicole. You're such a, you just are overflowing with wisdoms and practical strategies to address so many different issues of our health and well-being. So thank you. So we're almost done and we'd like to um, have you all know that there are many questions that we weren't able to answer, but we're gonna review them and um, try to answer them in a, Q a kind of Q&A kind of a document. Also remember there will be follow-up town halls and webinars to address additional questions and concerns regarding the operations and public health mitigation and compliance in the coming weeks. So today I'd like to just summarize some of the things that we learned from Dr. Katona about the complexities of current case numbers and trajectories, as well as the risk of opening our campuses compared to the pre-K through 12 campuses and the overwhelming evidence showing vaccines and masks work. Dr. Yagane sharing by using a layered mitigation strategy that includes vaccinating all vaccine eligible individuals, wearing masks and improving ventilation. Schools can be a safe location for the community members and schools are an important part of child's academic and social emotional development. And we all need to make every effort to keep schools safe and open. Dr. Bursch describes how by taking the time to honor and thoughtfully process our emotions related to the pandemic, we can consider what changes we can take to cultivate greater joy and meaning in our lives. And in turn, we can optimize our resilience as we emerge from the pandemic. Dr. Avedon, emphasized the importance of making sleep a priority as, as sleep deprivation, such as from COVID somnia, can compromise learning and impair memory and so many other negative outcomes. And, at la and last but not least, Dr. Green taught us to address uh, basic needs first, implement self-care, assert yourself and your boundaries, invest in your mental health through goal setting and self-compassion. And lastly, engage in community and action for a sense of belonging and purpose. I also recommend listening to the Semel HCI Live Well podcast episodes featuring today's speakers to get a deeper dive on the topics they covered. Resource links will be sent to you in the follow-up town hall email, or you can send us a message on the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative website for additional information. 
Thank you again to all of our esteemed panelists and to those turning, tuning in. And thank you for your time and commitment in keeping our campus operating, vibrant, and thriving. We are grateful to have this opportunity to speak with all of you today. And again, please tune in to the additional town halls and webinars in the coming weeks that will address the more operational and public health mitigation and compliance aspects of work transition. With gratitude to all you Bruins, have a great afternoon. <laughs>